Your thoughts affect your faith. Today on Fixing the Money Thing. Everyone is made unique and it is that uniqueness that is valuable and the world tells you that you need to be common, but your uniqueness is the key to your future. Being in agreement with heaven, fully persuaded, God can then, being in faith, gives heaven legal jurisdiction through you. Not everyone, but through you. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. Welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Dorinda Cassie, and again, we are glad to be together talking about your money. We are. Yes. Many times we think that what we have is not going to make it for us. It's not going to do anything. When we're in financial trouble, I know it's, back when yeah. we were struggling financially, yeah, yeah. it seemed like we really had nothing to work with. It but seemed that way, always yes. something, isn't there? There always is something. Today, we're going to talk about that. So many emails we get, people go, I'm hopeless, I don't mm -hmm. see any potential, but Drenda, there always is that potential because everyone yes. is made unique, and it is that uniqueness that is valuable, and the world tells you that you need to be common, but your uniqueness is the key to your future. You just need to see it. Today, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about you and helping you see how special you've been made, which is a key to your future. Gold mining was once second only to agriculture as North Carolina's most important industry. It all started back in 1799, just as the United States of America was young and growing, that a large gold nugget was discovered on the Cabarrus County farm of John Reed, a former Hessian soldier. For three years, the chunk of rock was unidentified and used as a doorstop in Reed's home. A jeweler from Charlotte recognized the rock for what it was, a 17-pound gold nugget worth approximately $3,600 at the time. John Reed agreed to sell the nugget for $3.50. It has been said that Reed later received an additional $1,000 for his error. In a short time, many more nuggets were found on the Reed farm, one weighing 28 pounds. After finding all the surface gold, Reed and his new partners, James Love and Martin Pfeiffer, opened a mine. It is estimated that more than $10 million in gold was taken from the Reed farm alone. But it all started with a heavy but unnoticed doorstop. We love getting your emails, your questions. Here's an email from someone who says, uh, someone gave me a set of your early CDs and they sat in my to-do stack on my desk for nearly two years. Mm -hmm. My wife saw them, listened to them and loved the series. Eventually, she got me to listen to them with her. While we were not in debt and our house is paid for, she wanted a newer car. So we decided to sow a seed of $150 toward a very specific newer car. In less than 10 days, we received a totally unexpected notification that we had been underpaid an amount equal to nearly 20 times the amount we sowed. It was our first taste and a new beginning of the kingdom. What's interesting, Gary, is these CDs were in their house. You know, today we're talking about yes. what's yeah. in your house. And these were all, all along sitting in the house. And he goes on to share how they did a Bible study, shared this with uh, 30, 40 people in their church, and how they have all these testimonies. They go on and on about awesome. uh, new jobs and situations. But all along, the key was sitting right there yes. in his uh, stack of yeah. to-do things. And so many right. times, what we need is right in our house, isn't it? Amen. It's right in the house, but we're not seeing it. You can be sure of this. God is always trying to get his word to you in these kind of situations. It's always there if you can just see it. And so, you know, the story we just saw, these guys were tripping over this 17 pound gold nugget. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Scrambling to buy groceries, trying to survive. And here they got this gold oh, sitting there. It was in there. their house. Yeah, it's in their house. 
And uh, so that's what we're talking about today. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. Let's go over to the screen here. And let's talk about what's in your house. Before you answer the question, though, let's, let's wait to the end of the show. Get your pencil paper out. Let's follow along here. Get your Bible. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets, this is 2 Kings chapter 4, cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. That's a tough situation. I mean, her whole life is now, you know, it's foreclosure time. All right, Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Now, I want you to underline that word in your Bible, how can I help you? Now, notice in those days, they weren't born again, so they came to the prophet to receive direction from the Lord. So he says, how? Now, this is, if you catch this, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And here's a rule we need to mark. God can only work with what's under our legal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. All right? which in this case looks like it's pretty slim, right? right and we may be looking, house. yeah, and people watching today may say, well, that's good. Yeah, I'd like you to find something in my house. I guarantee you, it wasn't any worse in this situation. So what do you have in your house? Notice how he says, how can I help you? My ability to help you is limited to what you have under your legal jurisdiction. Something you do, something you have, Obviously, you're not seeing it like this couple with that 17-pound gold nugget. They didn't see it, but God knows where it's at. It may be a skill. It may be your uniqueness. It may be something that's hidden, but God wants to show you what it is, okay? What's in your house? Your servant has how much? Nothing. <laughs> it's, isn't that? There, I, no, she emphasizes this. There is nothing there at all. I like how she emphasizes. It's like, you're nuts. What do you mean? That's why I've come to you. What do you mean? There's nothing. I just came to you. They're going to take my boys away. Don't you think I would have exhausted my resources to keep my boys? I mean, come on, prophet. You know, I need, I need God and I need to hear God. All right. Mm. I have nothing at all. That may be what you're saying. We, we, we found that out. We didn't have anything except a small jar of olive oil. Wow. And he goes on and says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. And of course, you know the story. The jars filled and filled until they ran out of jars. The question I ask you, Drenda, what's in our house? She didn't see it at all. She was actually offended by the question. You know, what do you mean? What's in my house? But see, God used what she had, that little bit of olive oil, to turn it into her future. She literally became an oil tycoon. The Bible goes on and says to her, the prophet said, after the oil multiplied, go sell the oil and live on the rest. Go sell the oil means to engage in commerce, marketplace, change the oil to the money that you need, mm. change what you have, and God has touched to what you need. Do you follow that formula? Yes, yes. Take what you have, get God involved with it. It converts to the money that you need, and that changes your life. Good, excellent. Now, when we were destitute for nine years. Yes. I was just thinking about that story. There was a point where I remember my mom calling and mm -hmm. saying, how are things? And I said, they're fine. <laughs> and she said, open the refrigerator, and what do you see? And I said, nothing except an empty jar of mayonnaise. And I started to cry yeah. because, you know, the, the, the refrigerator was empty, but I yeah. kept the jar of mayonnaise in there just because it looked like there was something in there then, you know. But we yeah. did have some things that God could use. We did. It wasn't But what we had, <laughs> what we had was failing. Yes. Everything, it was, it was failing. We were, we were destitute. And this wasn't like a short period of time. This is nine years. Mm. We were struggling just to survive. Struggling. So... We began to get a hold of the kingdom of God, actually how the kingdom operates, how God legally gets involved with our stuff. Like the story, what do you have? She got direction by the, by the prophet, go get jars. She got a plan given to her by the prophet. Or God gave a you know, plan through the prophet to her, and God got involved with that situation and changed it. So when we got a hold of the kingdom and began to apply kingdom law to the nothing that we thought we had, we, at least I was, surprised of what God said do. He said to us in a dream, take your failing business and change it 
and put it in my hands. Let me say it again. I was involved in sales. I was involved in insurance sales and different areas of financial sales, and we were, yes. we were starving. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the dream he gave me, when we began to apply kingdom law, he showed me a picture of the business we had changing its purpose and being a purposed company for the kingdom of yes. God. Instead of looking at that business as a method to make money to survive, we looked at that business as a means of touching the culture for the kingdom's purpose, mm. and money then came out of that. When we got the dream, he took that broken business, but he took our experience. Although we were failing, we had some experience with the financial services industry. So he didn't take me out of that field. He just changed it. He just did some changing with what I had, and we created a brand new company which prospered and amazingly paid all of our debt off, provided cash flow that enabled us to pay cash for our land, you know, our house we're building, things that were going on. And still today, 30 years, 20, I guess 25 years later, still producing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And we're able to fund kingdom. And we business. fund kingdom assignments you know, with it's, that it's business. It's exciting because it was yeah. all the, it was there all along. It was. The ability, the business, and the experiences. But when we yeah. brought it to God and gave it into the kingdom and we started utilizing our business to fund kingdom vision, that's when everything changed. It was an amazing transformation. But it took God's... I had to get to the place... You remember, I mean, we were, we were like crying out to God. It's like, we were Christians the whole nine years. Something was wrong. I mean, we knew that something was wrong. So we began to cry out to God, and He gave us a plan through a dream and changed our situation. You're watching Fixing the Money Thing. So what is faith? Your faith has healed you. Well, I want, I want to be healed. What is faith? How do, you know, what is faith? I got to know what that is. Christians use the word faith like it's water. Most of the time, they have no clue what it is or if they're in faith. That's not being negative, that's just being, because if, it was, if they were truly in faith, you'd see all kinds of mind, signs and wonders. That would happen, right? Because the word of God doesn't lie. All right, so we understand, though, that if there's a short circuit in, in the words of God, it's always on this end. You understand that? God never lies. Power's always on. If there's a short circuit, the switch isn't turned on, we always examine that. If you, do, if you leave the conference and you only get one thing out of it, remember that. Yeah. All right. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. We're looking for some clues here of what it means to be in faith so we can know how to turn the switch on. Romans chapter 4, verse number 19. Without, this is speaking of Abraham now, without weakening in his faith, there's that word, but it doesn't give us any definition. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Still no definition of faith there. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Well, there's faith. Faith is being in agreement with what heaven says, being fully persuaded of what God says. When you are fully persuaded of what God says, you're in agreement with heaven, that's called faith. All right, that's called faith. Fully persuaded. Why is faith necessary? Why can't God just heal whoever and everyone? You should be able to answer that by now don't have jurisdiction. Who, who had authority over the earth realm? Adam did. Men do. Men are the, still the only legal entity on the earth realm. God gave the earth to men and women. And so, as we found out, God couldn't just come busting in here. He had to go through a door, just like Satan did. He had to go through a, someone living on the earth and fully persuaded of what heaven said. That was Abraham. It said even though he understood the fact that they are way too old for babies, he was fully persuaded of what God said. He, was, he had faith. All right. And that faith is what God used to open that door, it made it legal, because now heaven had legal jurisdiction to invade the earth realm through Abraham. Are you got it? 
All right. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, this is when the devil was tempting Jesus. Uh, he showed Jesus in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their what? Authority and splendor, wealth. For it has been given to me. Who gave it to him? Adam did. All right. So in Mark chapter 6, we find, let me ask you a question. If uh, you ask someone on the street, if Jesus could heal people, anyone he wanted to, they would probably say what? Oh, yeah, he's Jesus. And what would you say if I said he couldn't? Oh, I, I tried that one time. I had, I, had a, I had a speaker lined up to come and speak at a provision conference. Very talented lady in business. And she got a hold of my teaching. And when she heard me say that, when I just told you that Jesus couldn't do some things and that faith was required, she called me and said, I'm canceling, I'm not coming. I said, why not? She says, I don't believe what you said. I don't believe like that. I said, well, it's right there in the word. She said, I'm not gonna argue with you. I don't believe that, that's not true. I said, right there in the word. She didn't come. Because most of the church believes that. They believe that. They don't understand jurisdiction. They don't understand what faith is and why it's required. We know that faith's required because God cannot invade the earth realm. It's been given to men and women, right? And the only way he can legally bring his power here is if someone who owns legal jurisdiction on the earth allows or invites that authority to flow through them in the earth realm. Being in agreement with heaven, fully persuaded, God can then, being in faith, gives heaven legal jurisdiction through you. Not everyone, but through you. Mark chapter 6 says Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on sick, few, a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of what? Faith. Why couldn't he heal them? Heaven had no jurisdiction. Unbelief. Heaven had no jurisdiction. Now, heaven had no jurisdiction. So let's look at Romans 10, 10. This is how you receive salvation. The Bible says, you believed in your heart and you were justified. Now there's that term again. We said last time we mentioned the word justified or justice. What did it mean? It's a legal term, meaning administration of law. So you believe in your heart, meaning fully persuaded what heaven says. Your heart is fully persuaded and you're justified. What does that mean? It means it's now legal for heaven to invade earth through you but nothing happens. Just like the power lines are on at your house. Paid your bill, power's there, but not on in your house. You gotta flip the switch. So you believe in your heart and now it's legal. You're justified, then what does it say? It's one sentence. And you confess unto salvation. See, because you have jurisdiction on the earth realm, you have to release that authority. Are you following me? You're the one it has jurisdiction, the power lines are on, it's, you're justified by believing what heaven says, but still nothing happens until you actually release that power, that authority into the earth realm. You got it? Okay, getting it there. Okay, that's remin So uh, the heart of man or woman is the interface of heaven and earth. You write that down. Your heart Everything heaven does will go through your heart, your belief system. Either you're going to be persuaded of what heaven says or you're going to be in fear, but heaven cannot move until you are fully persuaded. Everything you receive, everything that heaven says is yours, every promise has to go through that process. Amen. So we have a problem. We've been trained for 30, 40 years in an environment of fear. We've been trained for 30 or 40 years not to believe what God says. I mean, I can't mentally say, okay, Gary, I'm gonna believe what God says. People try that. They walk up to you and say, oh, you have a cold, let me pray for you. And they have no more faith that you'll be healed than anything else. They do it out of religious duty or just religious habit. Yes. Come on. I know I'm kind of treading on thin ice there. <laughs> I'd rather tread on thin ice and shallow water than deep water, wouldn't you? Okay, so we need to define what fully persuaded is. And there's a real little exercise I like to do to help you figure that out. I'm going to find a color. Okay, these lights up here, these green lights all around here, green lights. Now, 
If I said they're green, what would you say? And if I said, you're crazy, they're green. Back when the Crayola company was formed, the owner of that company hated red and called it green. And ever since they made crayons, that's what was been taught in the public school system. And that they, that color was originally green. What would you say? What would you say? Who's the, who would say, who's the crazy one? You would say you're the one's crazy, right? Why? Because you're fully persuaded that's, that's red. Are you not? How many... Do, are you emotionally bothered by that? If I said, I mean, you're convinced it's red. You're not bothered. If I said anything, you go, it bounces off you, doesn't it? You're fully persuaded. You're fully persuaded that gravity is going to hold you to that chair. Fully persuaded. Now being fully persuaded, that's what it feels like. When you're in faith, it's like, that is red. You have cancer, you're going to die. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. That is red. It's red. You're going to die broke? That's red. That is not even possible. I don't even entertain it. I don't even pick the thought up. Because the shield of faith, shield of faith, being fully persuaded, it just bounces off. It doesn't even come into your mental ascent. It, does, it's, it shields outside your body. It's, it's out here. The shield quenches every fiery dart. It doesn't even enter into your mental thoughts. You reject it. Just does, it just bounces off. Now, if it doesn't bounce off, guess what? You're not in faith. Now we realize, wow, a lot of the times I'm not in faith. A lot of times I'm trying to pray the prayer, prayer of faith while I'm in fear. Hello. Praying the prayer of faith while you're in fear doesn't work because you can't have fear and faith operating together. And you're going to find, quite frankly, many, many, many times you'll find you're not in faith. So what do you do about it? You got to know how to handle that. Okay. So how do I get in faith then? Okay, so now I realize I'm not in faith. I'm, I'm, I'm meditating more on what could go wrong than what could go right. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of the earth curse system. I'm not meditating on the promises that, yes and amen, praise God, that's mine. Instead, I'm going, oh, well, you know, you're, you're thinking all the negative side of things. And it happens subtly, friend. I was just telling our team back there, you know, I know there are a lot of you have been to these conferences before, heard the same teaching. You know what? It's been a while. You know what? You're listening to something every day. And with you realizing it or not, you are being slowly transformed by what you hear and meditate on. And it's vital that you meditate on the promises and what the kingdom says. 